Thank you all for coming. We are talking about fire and public safety applications in GIS. I think we have some pretty good presentations going on this afternoon, so I'll keep you guys awake. It's going to be very interesting. Uh, we have three. Uh, we're going to keep them about 20 minutes, so uh, we'll have time for questions and answers and have time for the next person to set up. Uh, first up, we have integrating city and county fire data with web services. And these are a couple of folks from the city of Asheville. We have Scott Barnwell and we have Stephanie Osborne. And I'll turn it over to them. So sorry for the most boring title on the planet. So we changed that. We changed that slightly since we uh, originally submitted. We realized, like, I, I don't know if you all do that, but sometimes you submit something and you look at it like three months later and you're like, what in the world were we thinking? So anyway, sorry. Same topic, but slightly different. So I'm Scott Barnwell, here with Stephanie Osborne. We're both from City of Asheville IT GIS uh, team. And um, let me get this started here. OK. There we go. All right, so. All right, so with the city's GIS team, we're responsible for managing the city's enterprise GIS database. We work closely with our fire department, with the water department, really with the whole city. Um, and we think we do a pretty good job of that, right? Um, we, at least we've always felt like we did a pretty good job. Anybody here from public safety, fire, fire departments? All right, good. So hopefully your GIS people treat you well. But we, we, uh, we, we love working with our public safety folks, um, fire and police, um, and we work with them a lot. And we thought we were doing a great job taking care of this data, working closely with the water department who ultimately um, installs hydrants and maintains the actual infrastructure um, until something happened and then we realized maybe we weren't doing such a great job. And so that was a fire. Um, so about 14 months ago, it was actually December 4th, 2015, there was a fire in North Asheville at the West, Westall apartment complex off of Merriman Avenue, which is one of the main thoroughfares in North Asheville. Um, and our, as expected, the firefighters arrived on scene quickly, ready to put out the fire, which they did. Um, however, when they went to tap into the nearest hydrant to get water to actually put that fire out, um, the, the hydrant malfunctioned, water started spewing all over the place. They basically couldn't use it. And not only could they not use that hydrant to put out the fire, but suddenly Merriman Avenue was flooded and traffic in both directions was completely blocked, which impeded additional emergency vehicles from even getting to the scene. Because this was about 30 yards off of that main thoroughfare at this apartment complex. So uh, clearly um, the hydrant failed, and I would say the hydrant data also failed. We just didn't even realize it until an event like this happened. Um, fortunately, nobody was hurt. They got the fire put out. They were able to go. Our firefighters are extremely efficient, as most firefighters are, um, and they're extremely well trained. And so when that uh, incident happened, they were able to find the next nearest hydrant, plug in, put out the fire. All was good, or almost all was good. Um, perhaps there was a bit more damage than there, than there would have been otherwise. Um, and in addition, folks started asking questions like, why did that fire? It, the, the story afterwards was as much about that, that hydrant that didn't work as it was about the fire itself. Right, so a month later, January 14th, this uh, article gets published and there's a reporter just asking questions as they should. It's they're you know, uh, looking into why, why this happened. Uh, they cited the, the fire in, in December and the headline was, will your fire hydrant work when you need it? And we all hope yes, but the honest answer, what, what we found out as a process um, of working through this was we really didn't know. Um, and so we're gonna talk to you a little bit about how we figured all that out. Um, a lot, some about technology, a lot about collaboration. A lot of the stuff that was talked about on the main stage this morning is so incredibly relevant to solving a problem like this. It's so much more about the people and folks working together and collaborating than it is about any specific technology. So um, when this happened, we just happened to be meeting, as we do often with our firefighters, um, to talk about another issue, and that was uh, fire pre-plans. Like, how could we get pre-plans accessible to firefighters in the trucks when they're en route to a fire? So they know what the building's going to be, they know the floor plan of the building. They know um, information about that building. It was just something of keen interest. Well, because this had happened, they actually, um, it sort of changed the topic a little bit. And we started talking about uh, bonnet colors of hydrants, which is something I was completely unfamiliar with. Um, and anybody know what a bonnet color is of a hydrant? Got a few, yeah, 
Public safety people, yeah. So, so these hydrants, if you ever notice when you're driving on the road, they're usually bright yellow or silver or something, so they stand out. But the tops are often different colors, and that corresponds to the flow rate. So a firefighter knows, like, is it a really high-pressure hydrant? They can get a lot of water out of it, or is it a low-pressure hydrant? And depending on where they're going, that can really matter. And so we started talking about bonnet colors. And in that meeting, they said, yeah, and not only was there this problem last month, but we really don't have any accurate information on bonnet colors. It was in the GIS database, but none of the information in the trucks was accurate, and they had no confidence in it. So um, that led to us starting to sit down and, and talk, not just with our fire folks, but also Buncombe County, um, our, our CGIS folks, um, as well as uh, the, the, the county IT folks, and just really starting to understand the problem. And so with that, I'm going to let Stephanie talk about the problem. All right. So what we discovered was that there are four different sources of hydrant data uh, across different groups uh, in the city and the county. And so we had our city water department with hydrant data, our firefighters populating firehouse with hydrant data, and the county with hydrant data as well. And then we had the hydrant data in the trucks, in the fire trucks, with a static copy of hydrant data. It was about five years old of, from the county's data. So the data is inaccurate, out of date, and our firefighters actually stopped even using the hydrant information in the fire trucks. So as you can see, uh, we started putting all the data sources on the map, and we uh, field verified these as well. And we found out that the, well, here the beige circles are the county's data, and that's probably what the firefighters are seeing in the trucks. And we found that there aren't any hydrants where the beige circles are here at Retreat Hill Way, but then you see city hydrants over on South Charlotte Street and um, that aren't in the trucks. So the data is just not reliable for our firefighters. This is another example where uh, the firefighters are probably seeing uh, hydrant down this cul-de-sac, but in reality it's 290 feet away down, down the street. So if they go down this cul-de-sac, then uh, they're going to lose time in fighting a fire. Uh, th then we looked at the statuses of information about the hydrants, and we found inconsistencies as well here. Uh, down at the bottom, you can see a black star. This is what the firefighters have in Firehouse. They say the hydrant's not in service. The city, the blue dot, uh, says that the hydrant is working. Uh, and then up north, uh, there's a hydrant that the city has as removed, but Firehouse in the county have it as there and as working, so firefighters really can't rely on this information. So, um, so like I said at the beginning, the, one of the real difficult things about a, a process like this is there's so many people involved, right? We have multiple offices. We had the fire department, the water department, IT and GIS, where we were coming from. We thought everything was great, but we weren't actually the ones looking at that data in the truck. In fact, it wasn't until Seth and I went to the fire department one day and said, hey, could you just show us these hydrants in the truck? And, and we started, we were literally climbing up in the truck, kind of excited like little kids, or at least I was, because um, I'd never been in a fire truck before. And, uh, and on my way up, Chief Flynn from our fire department said, he's like, uh, there's no point in going up there because we don't even show those, we don't even display the data anyways because it's no good. And that's the first time we knew that. We just didn't even realize that they weren't, I mean, they wanted the information, but they just, they had decided it was so bad based on those maps that um, Stephanie was just showing you that they could show up and see a hydrant in the truck or be on route to an event and 
just as often as the fire as the hydrant would be there, it wouldn't be there. So really, it just wasn't of any value. And even if it was there, it might be out of service. So they really had to rely on their own personal knowledge and just scanning the street, too, and looking for the clearest hydrant, which is not the way we should be doing business. Um, so we started bringing together all these different people. And it, it really is all these folks because... Um, the county manages the CJIS system, the criminal justice information system, and as part of that, they use firehouse software where the firefighters actually maintain data about hydrants, right? They have all the information about flow rates, inspections, but that was all separate from the GIS data. None of this stuff had been integrated, and we just didn't realize that. We were so focused just on the fact that we had a database with accurate hydrants in terms of location, we thought that was sufficient. We never really dug into the business need behind it, and that's, I think, the hardest thing to do and probably the most important thing to do. And fortunately, I mentioned City of Greensboro here, who I think I saw somebody from Greensboro I was talking to earlier. Yeah, there we go. Um, Greensboro, uh, there was Chief Tuttle from the fire department and also Jason Marshall from the GIS team that we worked with. And I didn't catch your name, but maybe worked with you too, I'm not sure. Um, but anyways, Greensboro had been doing this, basically what we wanted to do. And we were able to learn uh, some lessons in terms of pulling these different data sources together between the county and the city and how to get that actually displayed in the trucks uh, the way that the firefighters would need it so that it would have value um, to them. So, um, and early on in those conversations, I just wanted to show you like, th these are those four data sets that Stephanie mentioned. Um, so the city GIS database had 7,716 hydrants. This came out early, this was about last March when we sat down and we actually pulled out a, we just pulled up a Google sheet and we started uh, we found all these data sets, first of all. We got all the right people in the room, and we started running queries and finding out what was in there. And you can see there's uh, vastly different numbers here. These are supposed to be all the hydrants that are available, right, in the system. So the county had a 1,000 less than we did. The firehouse software that the firefighters used had less than half of what we had in our GIS database because there was no integration whatsoever. Um, and then what was actually in the trucks, MCT is the mobile computer terminals, in the but essentially a laptop in the truck, um, we weren't even sure. And like I said, they weren't using it anyway, so it was sort of irrelevant. Um, what we did find out was that it was just very dated and it was, it was completely static. So uh, that obviously was not good. So what we did was we proceeded, kind of old school here, but we just sat around the table. We did a lot of whiteboards. This is just one from last uh, spring or summer. And you, it gets kind of complicated, but we were trying to map out who was responsible because we have um, water technicians that go out when there's a call, like say a, a car hits a hydrant, it gets damaged. Well, the water department's going to get a call. They're going to send out a technician. There's going to be a work order associated with that to fix it. Um, but you've got firefighters who go out and do field inspections in terms of doing those flow tests and do inspections every so often. I think their goal now is to touch every hydrant at least twice a year. Um, but then at the same time, we've got all these county departments, um, smaller municipal departments that all tie into the same data uh, through the county. And so pulling all this data and ultimately getting that published some way that the fire trucks could consume it was our end goal. And it took, uh, it's, maybe it sounds simple, but it really wasn't. Um, but it took sitting around the table like this on m multiple, multiple occasions and testing and iterating and testing and iterating. And we're just now actually getting close to being finished. There's still some work to go, but we're so much closer. And at least the data in the trucks now has gotten much better. So I'm going to let Stephanie talk a little bit more about how we got to a solution. Okay. Um, before, as you can see, we had four different hydrant data sets in city water maintaining their information all by themselves in their silo and fire doing their thing with hydrants and county doing their thing with hydrants. But nobody really talking with each other or the systems communicating. And then we have the MCT terminals out in the trucks uh, all by themselves, a static copy not even being viewed, not being used for five years, it hasn't been updated. So that's what we had before. And this is kind of where we are now in the process. We have uh, taken all the information and now we're flowing it together and we're putting it all the information in, into Firehouse. And uh, basically we decided the best source 
for the MCTs. The MCTs, they need uh, uh, location information, state plane coordinates, and bonnet color information. And we decided the best source for the location information were the GIS databases. So we pushed the location information to Firehouse. And so they have all the up-to-date location information from the city and county. And then we um, decided that Firehouse had the best information of, for bonnet colors. So then we pushed that information back to our city GIS. And once we got things synced up, updated, had good data, the county created a view of the location information and the bonnet colors to um, update the MCTs. The county created a view and then a REST service, our, our GIS REST service, uh, for the MCTs to show. So this creates a more automatic updating of the data in the fire trucks. And then we also have implemented, uh, we have our firefighters using ArcGIS Collector out in the field to update firehouse attribute information. And also city water out in the field to update our city hydrant information. And then we're pushing it into our city, it's going into our city GIS database and then pushing into Firehouse. Uh -huh. So the data is all synchronized and we're still in the process of making it, connecting everything and, and setting up jobs and making it automatic. So this slide just kind of reiterates that uh, we put all the information in one place so we could put it on the MCTs and that we're using our GIS information for the spatial information and fire, fire, Firehouse for all of our operational attributes. All right, and so where we are today, um, we're not quite finished, but we're, very, we're getting really close. And the main, the, I guess the most important thing personally is that we now have good data in the truck. So the firefighters, if they were responding to a call, would have good information. There's a caveat to that, and that is that because this is a relatively new process, um, the, um, the inspection data that the firefighters are collecting in the field hasn't, they haven't gone through a full cycle in order to get that um, into firehouse and therefore to the trucks, right? So it's going to take a little bit of time. They think it's going to take the better part of a year to get the first whole round of inspections in place, but then they're confident that the data is going to be solid going forward. Uh, but nonetheless, at least the data that's being fed to the trucks is no longer this static copy. Um, it's not perfect. We're, we actually don't have it fully automated. I'll talk about that in a second. Um, but, uh, but we've, We've taken a big step forward. Another uh, big piece, and, and Stephanie mentioned using ArcGIS Collector. Suddenly, we've got about 50 quality control experts now in the field checking on this data. Where we used to rely on the water department, which yes, they took care of hydrants, but hydrants are not their core business. They manage them, they they repair them, they replace them. But their core business is delivering water to customers and dealing with billing, right? Like they're drinking water. That's what their core business is. Firefighters, hydrants are much more part of their core business. So now we've got them actually maintaining and managing that data, which I think is critical because they're completely vested in the process. We've got 12 fire stations and there's people in every station who are gonna be part of this process. And in no time, our GIS data is gonna get so much better too because having done all this field verification that Stephanie and I did and, and learning about these four different data sets that nobody knew about originally, we saw indeed there are hydrants sometimes on the wrong side of the road, sometimes not there at all, Sometimes there's a hydrant in the field, but it's not in the database. Um, there are all kinds of quality control problems that the best people to address those are the firefighters. So we're really excited about that. We've also got this collaborative work going on with the county, with CGIS, fire, water, IT. Everybody's working together and getting together, and everybody's invested to making this, this solution uh, long term. So we're excited about that. Um, the idea of these silos forming is just not going to happen again. Um, 
Another benefit that came out of this project that we that was kind of unexpected, but we were thrilled nonetheless, was that now our hydrant data is open data. And used to be for years we've been asking for this because our, our GIS team, we manage the open data program at the city as well. And we're constantly pushing and looking for valuable data sets that would have benefit to the community. And hydrant data is one of those data sets we've been asking at least four or five years. And every time we're told, nope, it's exempt from public records laws because it's uh, utility data. And we understand that for water mains. You know, you don't want somebody messing with your water mains and dealing with the, uh, the uh, potable water system. But hydrants feel like a slightly different case because they're bright yellow and right there where you can see them, right? That's not something super secret. Um, and it allow, it makes it a lot easier for us to let the firefighters work with the data. Not to mention, we don't even know what other benefits are going to come out of this. So if you go over to the uh, exhibit hall, uh, I just I was um, talking to Matt Jones from Ezra earlier, and he's like, hey, we've got your open data from your police uh, um, incidents, your crime incidents, here on one of our demos. And I was like, that's so cool. We didn't even know about that. He's just pulling it off our open data site. You know, like this stuff happens. We've, there's a parking app that got deployed by a civic tech person. We didn't even know about it. They, may, they, they, they give information to the whole city about where there's parking spots available in the city. Um, we didn't have to do anything except make that data available and provide an API. And suddenly people start doing cool things with it. In Boston, for example, with hydrants, they started an adopt, an adopt a hydrant program where civic uh, groups can come in and um, manage the hydrant data. And they actually, they'll ad adopt hydrants and go out and sh uh, for the purpose of shoveling the snow out when it snows in Boston. Um, I thought, you know, a Boy Scout troop might take over painting these bonnet colors when they change. Just if the data is available, they could totally work together. So hydrant data being open is awesome. Um, and the last thing I want to say, we're quickly running out of time here, um, just next step. So the next step is we want to manage the data jointly with Buncombe County, not have two separate data sets, but have one hydrant data set that we can just, we already, we're already doing that with streets, parcels, addresses. There's no reason we can't do it with hydrants. It's one data set. The, the city boundary is, is just an arbitrary line. It doesn't really matter. We, we can work together and do a much better job. Um, and then lastly is having the bonnet colors just auto update in the trucks. So we're not doing a, a nightly job that we're doing now and pushing the data to the county. We want this all to be automated. So as soon as a firefighter changes a hydrant to be in service or out of service, we want that reflected in the truck. Or we want the bonnet color when the flow rate changes from a test, we want that reflected in the truck immediately. And that can happen. We're just, uh, there's just a little bit more work to do in terms of setting up um, the, uh, the interconnections there. And, and uh, it, but we're close. So with that, sorry, pushing up against our, our boundary here, but any questions? Yes. Right. Well, they're one of the responsible groups. Um, they wanted to be responsible, quite honestly. And you, I don't know if you saw in the picture that was there, but there were two firefighters in the room. Um, uh, they've been involved with this project. There's actually been more than two, but those two in particular. And they want to be responsible for this data. They, um, they, they're already doing inspections. As Chief Flynn from our fire department says, um, they're already putting hands on these hydrants twice a year anyways. So they're there. They can validate the data because they're there. There's no better way to validate your data than having somebody actually there on site in the field. And just giving them an easy tool, and that's, we found this collector app is, is a relatively easy way to do that, and it's easy to, uh, to push out to a large group of people. Um, it just seemed like a, an easy way to let them sort of take ownership of it and benefit the water department at the same time, by the way, because suddenly they're going to have better data too. So, yeah. Yes? So there have been a couple issues just in training, and Krista McNamara, who's sitting right behind you, uh, has been the one doing that. So, <laughs> yeah, right. It's going great. It's going great, exactly. But we're, I would say, and Kristen, correct me if I'm wrong, but I would say at this point we're we're basically at a pilot. Uh, stage with the firefighters with the goal of rolling it out to about 50 firefighters. We just have a handful right now testing the collector app and working through some stuff. And actually, Matt's still here from uh, Esri. We were talking over lunch about some just some process improvements we can put around that. So the conference is great because we're already finding new ways to do things that are going to make, make this even better. They're using, I think it's primarily iPhones, right? Or Android too, right? Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yes. Yes. Have you been asked to prepare a, an ISO rating polygon map showing where the insurance rates are different based on proximity to hydrogen ship? That's something that we were asked to in Berlin um, after we got the hydrogen data set. So, just to repeat the question so everybody can hear, have we been asked to prepare an ISO standards I, International Standards Organization, yeah, an ISO rating map? Uh, that relates to insurance rates, and um, it sounds like they've been asked to do that in Durham. Well, in Durham, everyone within, you know, they're, they're certified and have a certain response time, so we were approved for a rating of three for everyone within the city, but outside of the town, we had to the rating depends on proximity to hybrid. If you're within a thousand feet of a hybrid, then you have a, a preferential rating compared to other parts of the county. So, that's it's a great idea I think with the city uh, and we're mostly interfaced with the city firefighters um, I think I know they get the ISO rating and the accreditation and all that and um, and I know they calculate uh, response time or, or they can calculate out or like sort of response zones like how long it takes to get to any one address in the city um, but but I think you're right when you go beyond the city boundaries and the, some of these county agencies. A it's a lot of volunteers. For in, for insurance purposes. Yeah, that's a great question, and I will make sure to talk to the GIS guy from Buncombe County, who's here. I don't think he's in the room, but I'll check in with him and uh, ask him that question. So, great, great idea. All right. All right. Thanks. Thank you, Scott. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you. 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 Thank you